looking menacingly at a white woman. Vagrancy, loitering, 10, 15 years for that. Here's the kicker. 25% of people in the convict lease died, more than during slavery, because you don't, you, know, you don't kill off your property that you need to work for you. But they didn't have any protections because they have another label, do they not? <clears throat> and when you're going to oppress or subjugated people, what must you do? You must justify by relabeling them, but not only are they black, genetically inferior, lustful, careless, governed by caprice, but now they're criminals, which then justifies what we do. So 25% of them died under convict lease. Well, look, look at how lucrative it was. Convict leasing was so successful that by 1898, nearly three quarters of Alabama's total state revenue came directly from this institution. So did the trauma continue? But y'all free, right? Let's move on. So then we had, oh Lord, we got it now. Separate but equal. <laughs> Is it equal now, friends? Still separate though. You know what the Negroes are? Well, we're doing gentrification in Portland, but you know. <laughs> we know what the black folk are, don't we? Mm -hmm. You know where to find them, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, sign on the freeway that says next left hood. <laughs> but we know when we're there, don't we? <laughs> Keep it real. Okay. <laughs> Separate, never equal. Mm -hmm. And that's contemporary, right? Now we're going to get to how, where am I in time? You don't have a concept of that. Where, <coughs> where are we? Where's the time person? Where am I in time? Excellent. <laughs> so I wanted to endeavor to look at some of the more difficult pieces. <clears throat> because I, I really wanted to take a look at the some things that, I tell you, this, this moves into chapter three. I need to talk about J. Marion Sims. Could you find his picture? J. Marion. Yes, he came earlier. He'll, he'll find it. He cleans up nice. J. Marion Sims, let me tell you a little bit about J. How many people, you know him, you know. There are huge statues and edifices for this man. Great thing. How many people in the room know what a vaginal speculum is? <laughs> For those young men or men in the room that we've lost you there, what a vaginal speculum is, it's an instrument that was created to open up the vagina so folks could kind of peer in. Now, J. Marion Sims is the individual credited with that creation, and he is touted as being the wealthiest physician to have ever lived. J. Marion Sims was a physician in the mid-1800s, credited with the creation of the first vaginal speculum, which he made from a pewter spoon. Sims had built a makeshift hospital in his backyard where he conducted surgical experiments on unanesthetized African slave women. Sims reasoned that slave women were able to bear great pain because their race made them more durable, and thus they were well suited for painful medical experimentation. So this is someone who took an oath to do no harm. And he cut into black women without any anesthesia. Mm. Now let me kind of get close with you around why this becomes very important. J. Marion Sims becomes very important because the first question I asked was, first of all, where do all the women come from? How do you get them? And what the problem was is they would, it would be said that these women um, were not fit for duty by their slave masters. And here's why they weren't fit for duty. Many of the women suffered from what was called a fistula. An obstetric fistula is the breakdown of tissue in the vaginal wall frequently as a result of childbirth, which affects the bladder and or the rectum. The disorder causes leakage of urine and feces into the vagina, which made for a smelly and humiliating existence for the women. However, this condition did not preclude these slave women from participating in their daily work on the plantation, such as picking cotton, house cleaning, cooking, etc. So what duty were the women then unfit for? The obvious answer is that while black slave women were required to do manual labor alongside their black male counterparts, one of their other inescapable duties was to sexually serve their slave masters. Their malodorous condition made them less sexually desirable and thus they were unfit for duty. 
So you need to clean them up, Mary and Sam, so we can do them. But what's more important about this is how we justify. Remember, in order to oppress or subjugate, you have to justify that behavior. But it wasn't only the women that suffered under his reign. Could you show the all, please? Slave women were not the only group to suffer. Black infants represent the most innocent of Sims' victims. Black infants suffered from what he termed trimus nascentium, now commonly referred to as neonatal tetanus. Tetanus originates in horse manure. The likely cause of the disease enslaved infants, given their living condition and their proximity to animal stables. Sims attributed the condition to the indecency and intellectual flaws of the black slaves together with skull malformations at birth. Sims attempted to treat this malady by trying to pry the bones in the skulls of the tiny infants into alignment with a shoemaker's awl. I was careful to find one from the 1800s. He would stick that into the brain and the skulls of black infants at birth in an effort to realign their skulls because of the indecency of their parents. He is worshipped in this medical world. J. Mary Sims. But I was more curious about how a physician could do such a thing. And here's how you do it. You pathologize the people. Now, let me read what they said about black women, because it gets real specific, black women. <laughs> their first pathological symptom was their skin color. In a medical world that categorized life as either normal or pathological, people of the African diaspora were continually condemned to the category of pathological. Their abnormal skin serving as a foil for normal white skin. Stay with me. The skin, if you see black people, it, the problem is, is the skin itself is pathological because it's actually a foil over normal white skin. This is what medical <coughs> journals, journals suggested. Now we're going to find out how they named it. Medical tradition has a long history of perceiving this skin color as a form of pathology. The favorite theory which reappears with some frequency in the early 19th century is that the skin color and attendant physiognomy of the black, here's the reason why y'all black, is because of congenital leprosy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is why there's so many of us. We all have congenital leprosy. Now, we have a second symptom. The second symptom of pathology was gender. Black females were perceived to be Irreligious, lustful, and immoderate. Well, that's convenient, isn't it? Let's take a look at that. We need to really take a look at this one, because I have a whole chapter on rape. I am not can't even get close to what that did to me. There were over, and this is, comes out of a social workbook. In a social workbook, it states that there were over 600,000 mixed-race babies born in the mid-1800s, based on the census. Now, this was during miscegenation. That means it's illegal to marry. So who was sneaking out back, and who was raping whom? We have numbers. Young girls rarely made it to their teens before they were raped. But let's put that in perspective as a social scientist. Now, I want to get into that, to the, the fact that we were lustful, because then you see it's their fault, isn't it? Surely I raped them, but didn't they deserve it? Now we need evidence of how we know they're lustful and immoderate and immoral. Here we go. Their protruding buttocks and genitals were offered as physical evidence of their pathology. Anybody up there with a big butt? Anybody with a big butt out there? There you have it, you slut. <laughs> It's incredulous, isn't it? It's hard for you to even believe it, but you see it's in books. And the criminally insane right. But what was so amazing, I want to get right, let's get right up with that one, because the butt thing really threw me off. Because everybody wants that butt now, don't they? Yeah. J-Lo made it, gave us all permission to first have the butt, and it's an African butt, don't get confused about it. And it's a butt they couldn't keep their hands off of. They, now they're injecting the butt now. Mm -hmm. They're putting butts in pants. Mm -hmm. They're making underwear with a butt in it. <laughs> in addition to that, in 
injecting the lips with collagen, yeah. locking the hair, and telling you the whole time you're ugly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still looking for the safest tan. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And the sad thing about it is we believe we're ugly. Mm -hmm. Case in point, 2006. Oh yeah, she was cute. She had good hair. <laughs> yeah, she had good hair. And he, oh, he was oh he was fine. He was light skinned. Yeah. <laughs> Look at a music video. Same girl, isn't it? We might as well just take him over and over again. Tragic mulatto. Are you following me? I have people say to me, oh, Joy, are you going natural? Going natural? <laughs> I mean, you even have black people going, wow, she's, you must, she's militant. <laughs> and that's because I actually wear my hair the way it grows out of my head. Mm -hmm. Anybody white in here, anybody go, you're not going to keep it like that, are you? You're going to perm it or something, aren't you? You're not going to just wear it like that, right? I can see your roots, girl. <laughs> white people don't do that to white people. We have pathologized what is naturally us. And when we would want an assault or insult, you black, big lip. Nappy head, stay with me. Mm -hmm. You see, that's called post-traumatic slave syndrome. Mm -hmm. That's what that looks like. And then white people go, well, no wonder, look at them. They're so negative. Right? So let's move on. So then after all that, I, I, wanna, I, want to, I want to take a look at another piece. Because again, you know, you, when you think of someone that raped and did horrible things, you get the picture of a big, gut, toothless wonder. You know, and a straw hat and, you know. Get the boys and go on out there and get them. Well, let's just move and start looking at the impact the strange fruit had. You all know what strange fruit. Billy got in trouble for uh, recording that. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about the strange fruit. And I want now. I want now. This is in the, in the, in the book, by the way. I didn't put ugly pictures in the book. I'm not interested in re-injuring black people. But I want to, you to look at this picture. And there's only one reason why I want you to look at it. Is I want you to look at who's in it. Mm -hmm. This, this is just plain old regular folk. And the way that little girl is looking at that man, she can't be right. That's what's wrong with white people, by the way. It's right there in that picture. Because see, no one talks about what happened to white people. That's another book. But this is specifically, I show this picture because it's unbelievable. Got the little Sunday bed. They ran train excursions and let children out of school early to attend lynchings. Lynchings. Now, let's show the other slide because I want to read this one. It's a rather gruesome one. I want to get you prepared. But I want to read from this one so you can understand what they did at the lynchings. If you want to know the reference to this, you can. I have a, I have a reading list in my book. In addition to that, you can go on site on my line online with my uh, my website joylewy.com, and it'll give you some suggested readings. The name of the book uh, that I would suggest are two. One is called Hundred Years of Lynching. They're all newspaper accounts. That's by Ginsburg. Hundred Years of Lynching. No pictures. This one is a, a famous picture that you will find in a variety of places, but one of them is called Without Sanctuary, recently published, uh, which is a pictorial. And now what I'm doing is I'm going to read from the newspaper account. Before the torch was applied, the Negro was deprived of his ears, finger, and geni fingers and genital parts of his body. He pleaded pitifully for his life while the mutilation was going on, but stood the ordeal of fire with surprising fortitude. Before the body was cool, it was cut to pieces, the bones were crushed into small bits, and even the tree upon which the wretch met his fate was torn up and disposed of as souvenirs. The Negro's heart was cut into several pieces, as was also his liver. Those unable to obtain the ghastly relics direct paid their more fortunate possessors extravagant sums for them. Small pieces of bone went for 25 cents, and a bit of the liver crisply cooked sold for 10 cents. As soon as the Negro was seen to be dead, there was a tremendous struggle among the crowd to secure the souvenirs. Knives were quickly produced, and soon the body was dismembered. Now I want you to look at who's in the picture. They're crowding to be in it, in suits. So whatever m memory or thoughts we had about who these folks were, they were just plain common folk. But Joy, surely, you know, this has no relevance today. Between 1882 and 1967, 200 bills, 
and Senator Ava Gordley would know about this one, 200 bills were presented before Congress to outlaw lynching. Additionally, seven presidents urged Congress to end the practice. Each and every time these efforts were rejected by the Congress and lynchings continued unabated and unpunished. It was not until 2005 that the U.S. Senate offered an apology for what it termed domestic terrorism against mostly black people. And even then, folks wouldn't sign on it. So did the trauma continue? Boy, we're an amazing people. We're an amazing people. But we don't know who we are. And you cannot heal what you don't understand. We can't heal it if we won't look at it. So how does it manifest itself? Very quickly, let me go through some of my research, because I'm going to give you some examples of it. Um, there's a chart, and uh, I did work specifically on African-American male youth violence. I didn't want to look at violence, by the way. What I really wanted to look at was something I term in the book vacant esteem, one of the symptoms of post-traumatic slave syndrome. Vacant esteem should not be somehow confused with low self-esteem. Low self-esteem is when you can't do as many chin-ups as maybe your sister or your brother. I'm not talking about that. And I don't think esteem should be measured in terms of low and high, because there are people with perfectly high self-esteem that are assholes. And you have to go to meetings with them, don't you? <laughs> but they have high self-esteem. They ain't right, though. So I think esteem should be measured in terms of accurate esteem. It's accurate esteem. Do you have a, an assessment of yourself that is appropriate? Not high or low, accurate, and healthy. So these are things I looked at. I don't want to look at this. I told you, I don't want to look at violence. Why? Because my committee told me that uh, vacant esteem wasn't a social problem. Huh. Clearly. You know, that's not a social problem. A social problem, let me define it. Remember my graduate work. A social problem is a social problem. It can be defined as a social problem if a significant number of people <laughs> believe that it is a social problem. Or significant persons believe it is a social problem. And we didn't qualify for either of those, not black people. But let me tell you why I wanted to look at self-esteem. I wanted to look at self-esteem because my first work was with children. I saw things happening with black children that bothered me, disturbed me. Aside from the good hair, bad hair, and all the other ugly, negative black epithets that we would throw at one another that I heard in contemporary world around me, I was concerned about what I saw happening to the hearts and minds of little black children. And one of the things that I started to notice happened directly after I had come from South Africa in 1994. I went to South Africa on the heels of the inauguration of Nelson Mandela. And it was a tough time in the country. And it was an incredible time for me because it was in a fact for me, in a way, a rebirth, a pilgrimage, a point of normalcy that I never knew because I never knew how to feel normal as a black person in America. <coughs> This is an article recently published called, it says, My Black Skin Makes My White Coat Vanish. Mm. This is a doctor who was standing in the lobby and her, her clients would go, where's the doctor? Right? We're invisible. And I grew up being invisible, discounted on a daily basis. So when I went to Africa, it was the first time in my life it felt normal being black. And so I cried a lot. I cried so much, in fact, the eight of the women that I was traveling with got a little through with me. <laughs> now, there's a reason why they got a little through with me. The reason they got a little through with me is because, see, in South Africa, in this southern region, actually, I was in four countries, when you cry, you know, here they go, get that girl a tissue, find a tissue, dry that up. In Africa, they sing. And they just start singing. Four part harmony and breaking it off, right? And the whole room would just be singing until I saw crying. And this was profound. The Queen of Lesotho had her royal choir come and sing to this group of nine African American women who were professionals traveling throughout the southern region. And this was really good and emotional, except there's a little catch. After they finished singing, they asked us to offer a few songs. <laughs> and contrary to popular belief, we can't all sing. <laughs> and so the women in my group were, you know, we did learn a few tunes, though. We were even on radio after a while. Um, <clears throat> but 
my sister, who was traveling with me, we were on our way to listen to actually, and they got up and they met without me, the women. And so when I woke up, my sister said, Joy, you know we're going to Lesotho today. I said, yeah, I know. She goes, and Joy, we're not singing in Lesotho. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you need to do, Joy, to get your little self together, we need you to do that because we're not singing in Lesotho. <laughs> so I said, I'm good. I'm good. I, hey, I got it. Hold it down. So we all go to Lesotho, and when they have this meeting, the meeting is actually larger than this room, and people are coming from all over. We got people coming from villages, people coming from uh, the, <laughs> the government, everybody is coming to greet these nine African-American women. So we're sitting on the stage, and of course things have to be translated. So the guy who's translating, he is actually a descendant of slaves that were enslaved by the Dutch in a place called Umfravat in South Africa. <laughs> and Umfravat means the unexpected in Afrikaans. They were left to die after apartheid ended. But this man had gone back to learn the tribal language, so he each one of us would get up and he translate. So I got up, I was the first one, my whole, all the women were looking at me glaring like, right. you keep it together. <laughs> <laughs> so I got up there, I was good, I said, my name is Joy um, de Gruleri, and I'm traveling with, you know, and we're trying to build a corridor of relationship with our African sisters. And I sat on down, I thought I did good. My sister, my thumbs up, everything's good. Translator gets up, starts translating. Then he starts going on and on and on and on and on. And then people start chanting. It's just, you know, so my sister looking back and <laughs> So I leaned over, I said, uh, what'd you, what'd you say? He goes, I told him what you said. I said, I didn't say all that. <laughs> he said, oh, what had happened was, no, he said, <laughs> well, when I, I got to the part where I, you said you were African American, some of the people from remote villages got confused because they thought all Americans were white. So then I had to explain to them that you were the descendants of the ones that had been stolen away. And they were saying to you, welcome home. Mm. So, you know, everybody was saying, because I was crying, I was told. <laughs> <laughs> My sister looks at me. <laughs> so while everybody's on their feet singing, I'm tore up, sup, sup, <laughs> in the corner. So this black woman who was in the corner of the room walks all the way towards me, grabs me by the hand and said, did you think we would forget you? I am from Lesotho, and Lesotho is my home. If I leave Lesotho, Lesotho is still my home. If I leave Lesotho for 15 years, Lesotho is still my home. We mourned Malcolm and Martin with you. We are so, so very proud of you. You are African 300 years from home. We just wondered when you were coming back. And then I realized, how much of me had been taken from me. So when I came home, I was a little depressed. To Portland, to the hood. All right. <laughs> I was living on a knife, which is no longer the hood. <coughs> but uh, I was living on a knife, and I, you know, folks would call and see if I was coming out. They was worried, people on the trip, called, what's wrong with her, she ain't out. So finally, one day I had to come out, because my daughter ran in. She goes, Mom, there's a little boy outside. He said he gonna beat up Nadim, that's her brother, and he gonna pee on the car, too. <laughs> Which, as you know, could happen in the hood. <laughs> so I had to go outside. So I go outside to find a crew of young black boys standing, ain't nobody over 10, my son's trying to hold his own, but he's scared. <laughs> I walk right over to the little ringleader, and I said, has my son done something that I need to know about? Yeah, I wanna know if he got some kind of eyeball problem. Now, I speak Ebonics, and that, that kind of went, what did you say? I want to know if he got some kind of eyeball problem. What he staring at? <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, you want to beat my son up because he was looking at you? Now, I want you to contrast that, because in Africa, when they talk to you, when they were, you know how, this is what black folks do. Everyone. <laughs> don't, don't we do that? Yeah. My, White people ask you, God, you have so many friends. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's an acknowledgement. We walk down the street in the grocery and try not to acknowledge somebody. What, you too good? <laughs> you don't, 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 you know, you don't do that. Because it's so important in African culture, where in Africa it's even a step further. They, in all the languages, it translates to meaning, I see you. Yes. And isn't that what we're doing when we do this? Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have a language anymore, 
But we kept that. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm looking at this boy telling me that he going to beat my son into the ground because he was looking at him. I said, he could have been looking at you because he thought maybe you want to play a little basketball one-on-one. -on -one. We got the hoop out here. He could have been looking at you because he could have maybe played a little video game. We got a little video game inside. He could have been looking at you because you know the park right down the street on 9th and Fremont. He's, maybe y'all could almost kick it. Right? So the little kids are looking at me like, whoa. <laughs> you know, I got a little therapeutic on them. So, <laughs> finally, I give them my spiel about how we have to keep ourselves safe in the community. And how we have to, we have to protect one another and stand together. And then I remembered Africa. And Africa said, I see you. And African said, what you looking at? What? What? Well, let me put that in perspective for you. Because that happens, doesn't it? Let me put this in perspective as it relates to this. This comes out of the article I wrote. And, um, of course, you can find this article. It's very important. Uh, the Journal of Social Work Research and Practice. Uh, and you can go on my site and uh, download it as well. So an African-American adolescent respect the scale that I wrote. But I want to read this particular excerpt from it so you can put in perspective in contemporary society what I mean about that, what you're looking at. According to Anderson, respect is an essential part of street rules that are strictly enforced and regulated. <coughs> Simply maintaining eye contact for too long may be viewed as a lack of respect and a front that can escalate into a confrontation. In a similar vein, a snide remark that might otherwise be viewed as trivial may lead to an honor contest. Boy, I wish I had more time to talk to you about that. Where no party backs down until someone is injured. This is taken from a book by Regine Prasois. You can also find that um, in the book and on the, on the website. This is a quote. On my way back from school, I saw a young brother on a crowded end train eating sunflower seeds. Between his legs laid a mound of wet, disgusting sunflower shells that he kept enlarging by spitting on the floor. Though visibly frustrated and disgusted by his behavior, no one would dare challenge his position. An older white man motioned to him to stop spitting the seeds on the floor. In response, he spat the seeds with much more animation than before, while effortlessly trying to stare fear into the old man. I made eye contact with him. And he said, what? What? Believe me, in the world of powerlessness, this is enough for a shootout. He leered at me, then said, I thought so. And I responded with my generation's favorite confrontation closer, whatever. Now we were both snaring, sneering, staring, flexing, profiling, and posturing at each other refusing to yield the power we thought we had, creating two more powerless brothers in a confrontation over bullshit, two intellectual amp amputees looking for the upper hand while mentally handcuffed. That's today. That goes on. So I wanted to understand what is a relationship with that contemporary behavior, and why did that little boy look at my son and feel so threatened by him looking at him? What must he have thought my son was seeing? Because based on what we know about Erickson's model of development, what we know about Piaget, what we understand about human development, is that I attain to my self-concept based upon the appraisal of significant others in my life. So I am not who I think I am. And I am not who you think I am. I am who I think that you think that I am. So what did he think my son believed about him? What did he see peering back at him? He saw peering back what he hated in himself, and he was 10 years old. And I said, what has happened to this little boy that he cannot withstand a gaze, that he so hates the reflection in the mirror that he would destroy my son to destroy the image? That is post-traumatic slave syndrome. That's why I endeavored to look, and I didn't want to look at violence. I wanted to look at the internalized violence but that wasn't a social problem. So then I looked at young men that hurt each other. So first on the left-hand side, you have stress variables. The first two variables are what we call baseline variables, violence witnessing, and violence victimization. On the right-hand side, you have the dependent variable. In other words, I'm trying to predict this, and that is use of violence. I'm trying to see what the other variables have to do with the use of violence. So now those two baseline variables we already know produce violence. When people witness violence or experience being hurt, they are more likely to be violent. Fundamental basis baseline. The variable at the end is called daily urban hazards. 
Now, this was written by a black man, the scale. Sometimes, you know, how many people have heard of a stress inventory? Mm. Basically, they say if you move, you get some points. You get divorced, the dog dies. Anything, you get points. And we should have black on there, huh? <laughs> because being black creates a stressor, does it not? Now, I want you to know, being black and living in this skin, we've normalized the stress. Haven't we? It happens so often and they wonder why you act up when you get to the office. <laughs> because by the time you get to the office, you will have been assaulted so many times before you got there. You know, the person that somehow you're standing in front of them that you're invisible to. By the time you get to work, the person that's sitting right next to you that doesn't say hello to you. <laughs> you know, because that happens every time. You, you're invisible at work. We are all black people are invisible in at, at white environments for a number of reasons. I don't have time to talk about that. But one of them is, in African culture, this is what we always do. And you know what, if I see you this morning, I see you later on, I'm going to do that again. Mm -hmm. Because it's something we do. And you have people where greeting is perfunctory, so they'll look at you and keep going. Mm -hmm. Standing right next to you. Or they'll go, excuse me, can you get me those papers? What black people going to say? Uh, hello? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning? Good afternoon? Right? Oh, well, hi. Could you get me those papers? Right? Because we have a very different experience living here in America. But one of the things that I understand is not respecting a person and the idea of the stressors associated with being black, put an electrodes on a black man when a police car drives up behind him. Let's measure that stress. I two books, I have to name these because I'm not gonna have time in this talk to, <coughs> to talk about them. You must get, after you get mine. <laughs> one is called Breaking Rank. Norm Stamper. 34-year police veteran, chief of police for Seattle, retired, chief of police for San Diego, retired, wrote a book called Breaking Rank, has a chapter entitled Why White Cops Kill Black Men. Whole chapter. He told on everybody. And when he broke rank, he took folks down. He took them down. I don't know what happened to this man, but he started telling the truth. I, there is a slide you have to show. And that is the one where it's, it says, oh, you got it up there. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see it. He said, I've heard some police officers refer to prostitute slayings or to the slayings of blacks as misdemeanor murders, employing an unofficial code for this, NHI, no human involved. San Diego cops confessed to a myriad other acts of discriminating, including additional dehumanizing references to black on a radio call just at 1113 nigger, 1113 being a code for an injured animal, followed by, uh, what is that, a descriptor dog, cat, skunk. It was a pernicious form of discriminating injected with a large dose of misogyny that led to the labeling of the lone female officer in my academy class as a split tail, speculated it had something to do with a woman's vagina. This man goes on to give statistics on how many police officers in every police department across the United States are predators and saying that if you have a mother, a sister, a wife, a daughter, you should be afraid for them because they become police officers to prey on women. He told them. Now I gotta tell you, the man lives in a cabin on a mountain somewhere in the San Juan. So he knew it was gonna happen. This is a situation where again, I'm not gonna have time to cover that, but let me move on and move back to the, uh, the violent scale. Uh, very good book, very important. I think black folks should keep it on the dash of the car. Because you may, they may say we're paranoid, but folks are following us according to the data there. Another book you need to read, All God's Children. Fox Butterfield wrote the book. Fox Butterfield talked about violence, and here you find out who pushed whom first. Perfect representation, post-traumatic slave syndrome, if you want to see it in the life of a gentleman. Um, that actually was the reason why we started trying youth as adults. His, um, uh, this particular uh, situation here, I, read, let me read this one, because I think this is an amazing one, the last one I read. According to Butterfield, what emerged was not just a portrait of the Boskets, the gentleman Willie Boskett, the one who's now serving consecutive life terms. Youth tried as adult, cousin Willie Boskett, but a new account of the origin and growth of violence in the United States. Violence is not, as many people today presume, a recent problem or a peculiarly urban bane. Rather, it grew out of a proud culture that flourished in the antebellum rural South, a tradition shaped by whites long before it was adopted and recast by some blacks in reaction to their plight. 
The records also show that the vast majority of people put on trial for violent crimes in Annabelle, South Carolina, were whites. The slaves were believed to be, or thought to be a gentle people. Butterfield describes two forms of violence among the lower and upper classes, knockdown, drag out, where individuals often had their nose, eyes, or ears ripped from their bodies and dueling shooting and killing as a means for gentlemen to settle disputes. Now I want to put this in perspective in terms of my research that looked at respect. Are you following me? What was modeled is honor and manhood. How does a 16 year old black male in America get respect? Remember who modeled it? A duel is just a, a dressed up drive by. <laughs> but what, what I understand about that, that how, do you, how are you a man as a black man in America? If you don't have the material means to assert dominance or control over your resources, you have learned helplessness. Research tells us that too. Or you have hyper-masculinity where I've got, I've got to assert my manhood somewhere and somehow. So I'll strike fear in you. Survival. Adaptation. Adaptation. How do you learn to survive and adapt in a hostile environment? That's what black people have done all this time. And sometimes we heal crooked. Sometimes we did. But let me tell you this one thing. I don't know. Where am I in time? Okay. I'm gonna, let, let, me, um, let me just move and I'll, I'll give you time to give me questions. But I want to give you, um, let's see, put the slide up in terms of adaptation. <clears throat> what I did discover in my research, by the way, is that all my hypotheses are correct. The more urban hassles, more violence, more victimization, more violence, more witnessing, more violence. Racial socialization, middle variable, written by Stevenson, Howard Stevenson out of Penn State, black man. He said, this is a resiliency factor, so pay attention to this. He suggested racial socialization as an important way of measuring how black people cope and adapt. Well, what is racial socialization? You help black children, black men, women know that you're walking out on a racially charged battlefield, but you give them armor. I'm going to tell you, you don't have to be worried. You don't have to trust what my high school counselor told me, which was that I wasn't college material. Don't trust that. But you know what? We got your back. You got a God. You got mama, daddy, big mama, big daddy. We here for you. And guess what? You're not a descendant of slaves. After all, you're a descendant of captured free men and women. And you know what? It's going to be all right because joy comes in the morning. And we found out that the way you socialize a black child, you have less violence. I look right here at Portland. 200 African-American males, 100 incarcerated, 100 were not. Some of them were in the Rights of Passage program. People know Kevin Fuller. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I used that as a control group. And I used 100 of them that were incarcerated and found out that those who were racially socialized were less likely to be violent. But more important was what I discovered about respect. And what I discovered about respect is that when you disrespect black males, and what do they do in prison? They try to break them. You're going to create a prisoner. Mm -hmm. Now, you're going to create a, a, a criminal. You're going to create a sociopath. Because if you disrespect him, you're going to have more violence. And guess what? I put all the variables, multiple regression, stepwise, remember, uh, uh, regression analysis. So I wanted to look at all the variables and how they behaved and performed. Highest, greatest predictors of violence. What were the most significant predictors of violence among African-American male youth, all 200 of them, after victimization and witnessing fell out? Respect. Now, more importantly, what does respect mean? What does respect mean to a black male? I ask people, what does respect mean? I ask white men. White men told me it means earned regard. When I ask black men, they said it's a sense of worth and value. Much deeper, isn't it? Guess what respect means? Doesn't mean either of those, by the way. Comes from the Latin. Respect. Look again. That's what respect means. Look at me again. Don't look the first time. Look again. That's what it means to respect. And that's all these young men were saying, please look at me again. And I want you to put that in context. I see you. Look again. That's what my research taught me. That these young men wanted you to look at them again. But we can't look past our socialization in America. So we need to socialize them. These are the destructive behaviors. Let's look at the corrective behaviors. I'll just put it up there and we'll talk about them. Because we did have not pathology, we have resiliency built up. These are the things we've used through the, uh, through the years, and I've broken them down from my alpha all the way to current status, the things. And I want to note for you that during Katrina, 
During Katrina, after we all know little was done, they implied, employed the very same methods to wrap you in so that you would go to sleep, to subjugate and oppress. What do you have to do to subjugate or oppress any group of people? You must justify the behavior by what? Relabeling them, and after all, they're just looters and rapists. Mm -hmm. Then they wrap you in that and go black. Mm -hmm. More died after that. I've been, uh, you know, I've been in the Ninth War. My family's from Louisiana, but they don't even tell you the number that died after Katrina. They don't even tell you about it because they've already convinced you they're bad people, even here in Portland, in Dallas, everywhere. We've relabeled them so everybody can wrap themselves in that. So we do have positive behaviors. Um, we do understand once we look at some of these uh, behaviors around how we look at each other, how our attitudes, um, we can in fact turn them around, but you can't change what you don't know. The book is full of those. I certainly didn't have enough time in this, in this, uh, in this day to share it. Uh, I don't do justice to what the book does because it does go in great depth. Uh, chapter 6, which is a chapter on healing, the reason I wrote the book. Note the title, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing. We can heal. Imagine we've come this far with no help. Imagine how much more we can do if we understand it. And we can start changing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. That and I'm sure the rest of the audience did also. Um, I'm really, I'm just kind of bowled over. It. That really, really impacted me. And, um, I don't really know where to start. So what I, I would like, you don't have any time. We were supposed to end at 1.30, but I just was not going to uh, interrupt her. And, um, if people have any questions, this is the time. Or you can wait till it's over. Thank you. Uh, in comparison, when you talk about Katrina, first thing that I, I, when I heard about Katrina, the first thing I thought about was Vanport. Of course. It's one of the same. Of course. So, and Vanport, the, the displacement, all the things were the same, and also the, uh, the disparity with what black people who experience, not just black people, but poor whites as well. Matter of fact, they used to do a, a, I don't know if they do it now for incoming professors here at Portland State, they used to show a video of the making, because this was called Vanport College. And the first time I saw it, not only was there not a black person in it, there were no women in the whole video, and they thought that was okay. So I complained a lot and brought pictures and gave it to them. So anyone that's seen it, I don't know if they've added black folks in there, but when I first got, you know, came into the program, there were no black people apparently. But there were poor blacks and whites in Vanport, that place called Vanport, and the flood killed far more than what the newspaper account said based on the accounts of the people themselves, right? So you still had that, and then you had against further displacement and again displaced again. So these are things that are, again, right up in front of us. It happens, and we are silent, which is the reason why it continues that. Can I just make an announcement? Sure. Um, on November 21st, uh, Joanne Bowman from Oregon Action is going to be here to be our next speaker for the Black Bag. And uh, Avel Gordley, let's see, I think she's left. Hi, Avel. Avel is going to host that event. I won't be here. And so I hope all of you can be in attendance for that event also. Thank you. Now, I know. You can I got a book for you. I told you I'd give you a book. I'm going to give you a book. So I'm going to give you a book. Do you have any here? I brought one little box of books. So if anybody wants a book, I have. I want one with your signature. Okay, well, why, why don't I do that right now? Okay, I'm going to do that because I know they're going to close us down. You can always come up and ask. Do you want to have a question for me? No, for okay. a book. And you can't leave because you know my card. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But I saw the sister. Yeah, yeah I've been away from Portland for a long time. And when I come back, there's, there's two things that strike me as a black woman. 